Hello. Hola. Bonjour. Привет. Ни хао. Hello and welcome to Language with Chu. This is a series of videos on sounds and meaning. If you haven't watched the first ones, I recommend that you do because this is part four. So I've already talked about the other uh, theories and why I'm talking about this. So please check the videos about, above if you haven't and then resume watching this one. Here we come to my favorite of the three, even though I'm really, really uh, partial to the phonosemantics one too that I talked on part two. Uh, this one by Abraham Habesira is a fabulous book. In fact, I think everybody should read it just out of curiosity if you, if you like languages, because it gives you a, a new way of looking at them. His idea is that because we don't have any records, usually you see trees like these, right? Um, and you say, okay, well, it must be proven, right? That Latin leads to Spanish, uh, Italian, Portuguese, etc., Germanic, blah, blah, blah. And you take it as a given that that's it. But we forget that a lot of this is guessing, pure, pure guesswork. There's no proof. There's proof sometimes when it comes to the same language and how it evolved or changed. In my opinion, it doesn't evolve really, but it changes. Uh, but there's very little proof of how one led to the other. That, again, that's a topic for another video. But what Abraham Abesira says is that nobody asks some really simple questions. For example, what happened at the beginning that led to language? Did the language capacity uh, grow develop on its own and people didn't have language but were capable of it. Um, same with mathematics, for example, or did it all come about at the same time? Uh, what were the first words and how were they chosen? You know, who chose the first sounds? Who chose the first words? Which, who chose what to name? Then according to which law, how did they come about with a system? And more so when you, you start thinking about the structure of a language. Um, and as another series of videos, I'll, I'm going to talk about these questions more in depth and the different schools of thoughts and the different theories from creationism to Darwinism. And you'll see what a mess it is, really, actually. These questions aren't answered and are not likely to be anytime soon. But anyway, back to uh, his work. He asks, why did cousin languages adopt different sounds for the same concept? horse, cheval, caballo, etc. That's just for, for the word horse. Even though they're cousin Indo-European languages, they, all, they each chose different sounds. Maybe an explanation is what I just told you on part two about phonosemantics. Maybe not. Maybe there's something else that binds words together and makes each people uh, choose different essences of things to name them. Then uh, why does each word have a certain sound, certain combination of sounds, instead of others? Why do you, why English speakers decided to call an apple an apple and not a carrot? Nobody knows. And then finally, why did cousin languages choose the same sounds for different meanings? Like, appel is to call in French, and apple, you know what it is in English. Gato is a cake in French, and gato in Spanish is a cat. So the same combinations of sounds, uh, consonants in particular, but different meanings. Kind of strange, right? They could all have picked the same. Why not? Well, what's sure is that arbitrary consensus doesn't explain it. Uh, this decision that was just collective and, you know, a little group of people started deciding and they, they came up with a word and said, okay, let's name an apple an apple. Uh, it doesn't explain it. Why? Because there's too many parallels in all the world languages, not just the same families. So let's look at, let's look at that a little bit more closely. He talks about how uh, universal language ignores time, basically. What he calls universal language is what you can, what you can perceive if you study different words from different languages, as I'm going to do in a minute. Uh, you'll see that there's something that almost tells you that people back then were a lot more right-brained. You know, the right brain is the one that sees the whole, the essence, uh, the, um, the global meaning of things, while the right uh, the left brain is more uh, logical, it's analytical, it's the one where supposedly language is more uh, centered nowadays. But perhaps people in the past had more of an ability to think with their right brain and imagine things and, and perceive the essence of things, why not? He's not the only one to say it, actually. There are several uh, references I could give you about it, and I think it's quite convincing, actually, when you think about how words came to be. 
But this is just my analogy of it. And it's funny because uh, in a sense, this is the elephant in the room in linguistics too. Nobody wants to talk about these topics, as I said on part one. But imagine that, you know, you know the story of the blind man. So each blind man is say touching a part of the elephant touching a part of the elephant and nobody can figure out what it is so this one will guess he's touching a rope the other one a tree the other one a wall etc and the idea is that all of us together can see much more reality than each of us alone well extrapolate that to languages and what he's saying is that imagine this was the word for tree in uh, english in spanish in hebrew in Chinese, etc., etc., and each one of them conveyed a little bit of that essence of the word. And actually, when you combine them to be together, when you see them together, that's when you get a real idea of what a word means. It's kind of an interesting concept. If you've ever learned a foreign language, you notice that there's subtleties, words that are so so simple as I don't know, cabbage. You know, in in Spanish or in English. Cabbage is a cabbage, right? You don't think of many analogies or things to say about it. Well, in French, if you say, if you call somebody my cabbage, it means it's an endearing term, right? So cabbage has another connotation there of something endearing, cute, whatever. The same happens with almost every word, I would say. Even though they're exact translations, there's always a subtlety that you perceive when you learn a foreign language that wasn't there in your mother tongue. So he could be into something by explaining this as a sort of a, a molecule again. And let me explain to you how he came up with this uh, this way of viewing words. You start off with, uh, he says there should be two dictionaries. One dictionary for, uni for synonyms, so words that mean something similar or the same in all languages combined, and homonyms, taking words that sound the same. And he, sh he would have two dictionaries and combine them both. And so you start off with uh, with what he calls the square unit, which is you try to look between languages or the same language for synonyms, two words that mean something similar. And on the uh, x-axis, you um, you look for homonyms, so words that sound the same, share the same sounds. And he focuses on consonants, but um, I think vowels would apply too, except they're a little more flexible. They change more with time or, um, or across dialects and things like that. So he focused on consonants. But let's take an example. We have the word mesh, uh, which means wick in French, right? So mesh, wick, totally different sounds, but they have the same meaning, okay? Then you look for two words, one that will have this, the m mm and the sh sound in French as well and mean something different, and w and k in English, that would mean something similar here. So you have to find similar sound here, similar meaning here. And we got a pair, méchant and wicked. Um, so something about an evil person, right? And he says for each pair that you find like this, you in, in the six, seven thousand languages of the world, you may find five, ten, sometimes three or whatever. And what is interesting about these is that if you were to look as normal linguists or in general people look at them, they would find that these words were not related at all. They have different roots. All of them have different roots, and they uh, they tell you, okay, it comes from Old Germanic, it comes from whatever Gaelic, etc. Proto-Indo-European, they make up the words for Proto-Indo-European, and uh, Proto-Germanic, no traces, Proto-imagined, and then you came up with these, uh, you come up with these words. So notice the roots are different; they shouldn't be related if there's nothing in common, right? Yet you find out that there's something that combines them together, that binds them, that it's almost like a gravity force. Can you guess what that is? What do these words share? It's the idea of a torsion. A person who is wicked is twisted, just like the wick is, right? And you're like, okay, that's interesting. It's like almost like a like a force field that binds these four words together, even though they didn't have the same roots. Now, if you saw just one example, you would say, well, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe they got the roots wrong, whatever. But let's expand this example and uh, and do what he what he did to find these molecules of language, those that, that the elephant. You take any two concepts, like mother and wife or uh, and horse, mother, wife or horse or whatever, woman and horse, and you look for two homonyms, bride in English and bride in French, which means bridal. Okay, so there is a connection between words that have to do with horse and words that have to do with mother. Do we stop here? 
Hmm, maybe not, because when you have the word married in English, you also have a word for female horse in English, which is mare. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so even within English, you have married and mare, M R M R, and the meaning stays. So purple is anything that has to do with horse, and green anything to ha that has to do with the wife or the woman. Then we keep going, and oh, lo and behold, here is not even cousin languages. Mande is from Africa. It's a language in, in Africa, or languages in Africa. And the um, the word for horse is wifo, and the word for horses is wed, like she was she wed somebody. So uh, you still keep finding this among languages that are not related, not from the same family, and so on and for, so forth. You have in in Danish, kona is wife. And uh, you have in Russian the word for horse, kony. Again, k n. Um, then you have in Mandarin, and here I added them for the sounds because this one is ma and this one is ma, so they do share the sounds. But you'll see also, you see also that they share the uh, part of the character. This is the character for woman, and this is the character for horse, which you see here. So interesting. The ways the ways you write can also have this uh, form these square units. Okay, so then you take two more concepts. You take the horse that you had before, and you had the sea, and we find that mare in Italian and mare in English have the same sounds. Uh, mar is a pond in French, and mare again in English. Then you have aqua, water in Latin or Italian, and in Latin you have equus, like a question. Um, for horse, so you start having how uh, seeing how horse is related to the mother and to the sea, and the rule he made up, uh, he came up with is that if uh, if one of them is the mother is linked to the horse, and the horse is linked to the water, then the mother will also be linked to the water. Well, is it possible? Do we find it in any languages of the world? Oh yeah, for sure. We have mer, uh, mer in uh, French and mer, different spelling but the same sounds for mother. You have hai. In in Chinese, and you have mu in Chinese as well. Here, the sounds are not the same, but I put the example here so that you can see again that it has to do with the uh, ideogram, the the way it's written, right? So here we start seeing that there's a connection, and you could say, well, what's the relationship? Imagine that you were an ancestor, you know, a primitive man. Um, this is ten thousand BC. What would you be? Why would you be linking the wife? With the horse, or you know, anything like that. Well, in archetypes, or in, you know, in in general psychology, uh, people compare women with wild emotions, like horses. W women high in emotions, horses, etc. That could be one link. The other one is that they both carriers. The horse uh, is used for carrying uh, traditionally, and the wife, the mother. Carries a baby, right? And the sea could be the sea where the baby grows, the placenta. All kinds of analogies you could find for why these words are related and how they reflect some kind of ancestral uh, view of the world. You can keep going on and on and on. Here are some examples. I, I let you read them, but basically, it's um, it's the idea that uh, something ripens in the mother, like the baby. There's a wall. In fact, the, even the French word for uh, pregnant and a wall and enclosure is the same. So there's the idea that something increases in size, is broad, or is ripe, or is like a wall. So all these are sort of analogies for birth or pregnancy, and it's uh, it's fascinating. I, I really won't. I don't want to uh, annoy you or uh, bother you with the with so many details, but. The book goes on and on and on, and it builds on these until you get a, a, a story, which is almost like what you see in dreams. It's a different kind of language, symbolic, and it could represent, it could explain at least in part why so many words that are supposedly not related, like Chinese and English, have similarities. And nobody in linguistics has explained that. Nobody. They just don't know. They just say that it's it's random, it's arbitrary, etc. But there's just too many coincidences over and over when you look at them to think that it's just a pure coincidence. So to me, it's starting to look that there is a, a subconscious language that we carry around. It's a, almost like a universal fabric that something that binds all languages together. There are languages language universals, which I'll talk about in the future, uh, but there are very few and far in between, and the sounds. Seem to be more universal than we think, and then,、um, as I said before, different aspects of reality could be scattered, perhaps 
throughout all the language and that could be the confusion of tongues finally is that because we each each culture picks different types of uh, traits of an object of an entity of a of a feeling even to describe they choose specific sounds and they kind of omit part of the the elephant of what the meaning of the word is and maybe it's like a, this is a this is just a bunch of proteins for example and you see imagine that the word apple was here and each of these little strings are the word apple in a different language and then you combine them with the mother horse blah 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 and you end up with something that actually describes reality describes what it is to be human describes uh, why languages are the way they are instead of being different languages oh well these strings just happen to be there because whatever uh, it was random maybe they are all interconnected and we could find out if people were really dedicated to doing it so far I haven't seen many linguists that are interested in this because it's not materialistic enough you have to go a little bit think a little bit out, outside the box and ask questions that are a little bit uncomfortable in the field of academia which I'll talk about later but to wrap up with the, what uh, Abraham Abesira says in this book, he talks about two sort of forces. Creation on one side, so how words cre were created, but he talks about, about it more in terms of um, creationism, so God inventing um, the word and languages. And I'll get into it, those two, these two opposites in, fut in a future series. But uh, basically you have that languages evolve, change in my opinion it's the study of it it's etymology the study the study of the history of words but you also have something about creation or let's say for me is more like the information field uh, that is represented in these sounds that are the same and they both work together so you start with a repulsion uh, you start with different roots and they all diverge and form different words those are, those are historical uh, changes. Those are uh, com more conventional. They're decided by people, say. And on the other hand, you have a law of attraction that kind of pulls word, pull words together to sound the same, just like we saw with the examples before, wicked and wick, uh, that, and mesh and méchant, that actually makes them sound the same as if it, there was a, a glue that binds them, something that attracts them together. And the reason why people choose similar sounds to depict similar concepts and that talks about a, a, a something much much further in the past and a different way of viewing reality a bit like socrates like i explained in, in the previous videos where he talked about the words carrying the essence of things so on the one hand you have the etymology the uh, the roots of a word and how they spreads and on the other one you have the uh, the words that want to sound the same and group together and maybe that's why you have different families of languages that end up sounding uh, having similar sounding words. So that's it for theory number three. That's just the main theory. So phonosemantics, what Carme Huertas did with the toponyms of names of places, and what Abraham Abesira did in the book Babel. So that's it for uh, this part. I hope that you're starting to get curious about uh, language and sounds. Personally, I find it fascinating, and I think it should be studied more thoroughly, but unfortunately, so far, it doesn't look like it, because it's not in line with most of the academia says and thinks about language, especially when you get into Chomskyan uh, linguistics, which I'll talk about in the future. So I'll leave it at that, and uh, make sure to tune in again for the last part.